In the last example already, we saw that we can compute derivatives for systems of implicit functions, and I just wanted to get another example out there so that you really see what's going on, because there we only had one free variable, and we might actually have multiple free variables. So this is the, the simplest uh, case where you have multiple constraints and multiple free variables. So consider uh, the system of equations. and constraints. My f1 of, we'll call it a, b, c, and d are our variables, is going to be ad minus bc, f2 of a, b, c, d is equal to a, b plus c, d. And this is a neat example because if you look at this, this is the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C, D. And this is the inner product of the two columns of that matrix. Uh, and the constraints we're going to put on this is that, well, A, D minus B, C is equal to 1. So the determinant is 1. So the determinant of my 2 by 2 matrix is 1. And A, B plus C, D is equal to 0. But the row or the uh, the columns rather are orthogonal; they're perpendicular to each other. So, so two kind of interesting constraints for a particular matrix. Um, and again, we have we we count the uh, variables and the constraints. We have uh, two constraints. And four variables. So there should be, there should be uh, two free variables floating around. Uh, and say around the point A naught, B naught, C naught, D naught is equal to 1, 0, 0, 1. Right, and if we identify A, B, C, D with the 2 by 2 matrix, well, this is just the identity matrix, right? So it's kind of, this is kind of an interesting problem in that respect. Uh, so assume that we have A of C, D, so my free variables I'm going to assume are C and D, and B of C, D. So A and B are my endogenous variables, and C and D are exogenous. And we want to know what are the partials. of these functions. Right, so these are these these now have two variables, and so they have partials with respect to C and D, both of these guys. Uh, before we only had one variable, so we just took one derivative, and we want to be able to compute the partials in general. So this is gonna we're gonna figure out how to compute all the stuff in generality right now. Well, of course we do this, uh, you know, implicit differentiation business again, right, for our particular curves of interest. Uh, and so let's start with. Um, the partial with respect to C. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to compute the partial with respect to C and it'll be obvious um, what the partial with respect to D will have to be uh, or the process that you have to go through to compute the partial with respect to D. So we, uh, we take uh, the derivatives of these guys, right, the implicit functions. So DF1 DC is of course uh, DF1 dA, dA, dC, plus df1, db, db, dC, plus df1, dC, 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 plus partial f1 with respect to d, partial d with respect to c, um, 
which uh, which will be equal to or which then implies right so of course this is going to be zero um, so when I when I differentiate this implicitly I get the equation uh, and in particular this will be one DC DC is one and DD DC since D is another free variable this actually collapses to zero because C doesn't have any power over D it doesn't change anything and so when I solve the resulting equation I get DF one DA DA DC plus df1 db db dc and that's equal to negative df1 dc all the way in the corner there but that's the equation that you get and similarly if you take df2 dc and you write that all out you'll get the resulting equation being df2 da da dc plus df2 da or db rather db dc is equal to negative df2 dc and that's our system of equations for figuring out the partials of uh, a and b with respect to c uh, so we have the matrix equation df1 da df1 db df2 da df2 db times da dc db dc is equal to negative df1 dc df2 d C. And of course the partials with respect to D, I would just replace all the C's with D's here now. That's, that's exactly how we would generalize. Uh, and if we, if we actually work this out, all out, we have, well, D, F, 1, D, A is equal to D, uh, D, F, 1, D, B is equal to negative C. So the, what's nice about this example is you can compute all these things relatively quickly. DFDC is equal to B, right? Still, we still have to take a lot of derivatives. DF2, DA is equal to B, DF2, DB is equal to A, and DF2, DC is equal to D. Uh, so at 1, 0, 0, 1, we have that this equation, the matrix equation, becomes 1, 0, 0, 1. You can check that because df1, da is d, which was 1. Uh, df1, db is negative c, which is 0. This is 0. This is 1. Well, this should be a 2. Right? da. Um, and now I have the things that I want to solve for, D A D C partial of B with respect to C. And this is equal to you compute this out, this is a zero, negative one. And of course this is the identity, so you automatically solve all this. So D A D C is zero and D B D C is equal to negative one at this point. And that gives us essentially the idea behind the following theorem. That if I have fi from r n plus m into r1, uh, r c1, uh, and satisfy fi of y1 star up to ym star y1 star or x1 star this should be m plus n really x1 up to xn star is equal to ci for i equals 1 to m 
and this point uh, y star x eh, x star uh, and we have that the determinant doesn't vanish the determinant of this guy doesn't vanish at my particular point y star x star uh, then of course the implicit functions exist and I can compute all their partials in the following manner dy1 dxj all the way up to partial ym dxj so I, per I fix a particular j and that's going to be equal to negative df1 dy1 all the way up to df1 dym dfm dy1 dfm dym inverse times of course the partial of f1 with respect to xj all the way down to df1 or fm dxj uh, and this is for all j equals 1 up to n. Uh, and in particular, you know, I don't have to invert this. I could just use Kramer's rule if I wanted to pick off a particular value of this. But in general, if I have this matrix, then I can compute all the partials that I could possibly desire.